The basis for our sermon this morning is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This is the word of our God, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. How would you define happiness? And how would you define joy? Maybe when you think about happiness, you think about sometimes you're sad and and sometimes you're happy. Sometimes you're grieving and sometimes you're living it up. Happiness is a superficial emotion. It, It rests right at the surface of our hearts and it rides up and down the waves of our emotions. When good things are happening, we are happy. And when bad things are happening, we can feel sad. So how does joy differ from happiness then? Well, joy is a river that runs deeply at the bottom of our hearts. Joy is something that is a deep-seated emotion given to us because of the confidence we have in God's promises. It's something that is there whether we're grieving or we're living it up. It's something that is there whether we're happy or we're sad. A couple illustrations just to prove this point. When you think about the Apostle Paul, he had gone through a whole lot for his faith. And do you remember the time that he was in prison with Silas for preaching the good news of Jesus? And as he was sitting in that prison, what was Paul doing? He was singing hymns of praise to God. He was rejoicing in his heart. Despite the situation, he was still joyful in the Lord. But also, now think about Job. Job, who had lost his entire family in one day. And what did Job say through tears as he was on the ground pleading with his God? He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes. May the name of the Lord be praised. Maybe you have found yourself in that situation where you can understand that joy flows much deeper than any superficial emotion of happiness or sadness. Maybe you were sitting at the funeral of a loved one and your heart was torn open because of the loss of that loved one and because you couldn't be with them in that moment, but you didn't grieve like the rest of man because underneath it all, you had joy to know that you would see your Savior again and you would see your loved one again. You would be with them at the wedding feast of the Lamb. That's how Paul can say in our text for today, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice, because in Jesus, he has given us a deep-seated joy that is there during all the moments of our life by faith in him. Just stop and think about that Old Testament text for today, that text of a, a feast, a wedding feast. What are some of the most joyous times in life? It's when a couple gets married and then you have that big meal after their wedding and everybody's celebrating with them. That's the kind of joy that God wants to drum up in our minds as he shares with us that prophecy from Isaiah. Why do you and I rejoice every single day of our lives deep down in our hearts? It's because we share in Christ's resurrection. We sang about it in the hymn too. I am content because my Lord is living forever and I know I share in that life. I will be delivered from this world, 
to be given an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. An eternal inheritance where I will live in joy forever, where God will heal all the hurt that I've gone through in this life as I rejoice in his presence forever. What has Jesus given us? Jesus has given us everything. He's given us the greatest gift of all, forgiveness and eternal life. And Paul shows that joy in our text for today. But when we stop and think about what had led up to the text for today, we stand in amazement at how Paul could say such a thing. Because for close to seven years, Paul had been on trial again and again and in prison over and over. It all started in Jerusalem when the Jews came and accused him of crimes for which he was not guilty. And after being put on trial by the Sanhedrin, he was shipped off under Roman guard for his protection as a Roman citizen to Caesarea, where he was put on trial before Felix. And Felix, hoping for a bribe from Paul, decided to keep him in prison for a number of years. But Paul wouldn't budge. Paul wouldn't give him a bribe. And so eventually, after those years of captivity in prison under Felix, Paul appealed to Caesar. He used his Roman citizenship and his rights and went all the way to Rome. But in Rome, do you know what happened to Paul? He was under house arrest for two years. And what did that mean? It meant he was chained to a Roman soldier during his days and nights. Can you imagine two years being chained to somebody else? Oh, sure, he had a little bit of freedom, but not very much freedom considering that someone was always right there shackled next to you. And yet Paul, during that time, carried out his ministry with tenacity and with eagerness. He met with workers from churches around the ancient world and he penned a number of New Testament letters. He wrote the book of Philippians and Ephesians and Colossians and also a personal letter to a man named Philemon, a member at the church in Colossae. And in our letter for today, Philippians... Paul shares with us the joy that he had in the middle of his house arrest. This is what Paul says. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. As we walk through our text for today, we'll see the different ways in which joy affects our life. But the first way in which joy from Christ affects our life is it affects our relationships with one another. See, just before our text for today, Paul was encouraging the congregation to become arbiters in a dispute that was happening. There were two women, women that were involved in a bitter squabble with each other. Their names were Euodia and Syntyche. They were valuable members of the body of Christ, as all members of the body of Christ are meaningful to God. And they had served well in the ministry of the gospel. They had been Paul's partners in it. But now they were caught up in some bitter dispute. We don't know what it is, but it's unimportant. But Paul was telling to them and to the whole congregation, right now, I need you to focus on the bigger picture. I want you to see that your Lord and Savior is coming soon, that your race in this life is almost done. You have a heaven in store for you. And on top of that, when your Savior comes again, he's going to deal with you in patience and forgiveness and kindness. He's going to bestow life on you. It's almost done. So when you stop and think about that, Euodia and Syntyche, when you stop and think about that, brothers and sisters in Christ, let your gentleness be evident to all with one another. This is a message that we need to hear. Because oftentimes in the grand scheme of things, our disputes that we have with one another really don't matter at all. It's just our anger or our resentment that we get caught up in, the grudges that we sometimes hold, that we don't want to work through it that end up burdening us in this life, that end up getting in the way of the greater joy that God has in store. But just as he came to the congregation to proclaim to them joy and forgiveness, God does the same with us. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Evidence to all. Who is it that you have a dispute with right now? Who is it that you're angry with? Is it your spouse? Is it maybe even for years of what you consider to be hurt and maybe real hurt? Is it with your brothers and sisters? Sometimes you fight, you're at one another like cats and dogs. Is it maybe your coworkers? Who is it that you have a dispute with but now see the forgiveness that you have in Jesus? The peace that he has given you, 
the resurrection joy that you have in him and how the meaning of life is to be focused on him and him alone and work towards that goal of heaven. And he's coming and he's coming soon, so put those things aside. You are brothers and sisters in him. His blood has washed all of us clean. And so let that gentleness be evident to all. Joy affects our relationship with others. But now Paul goes on. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Another way that joy affects our life, joy in Jesus, lets us know that we can turn to him with any of the concerns, any of the worries and anxieties we have in life. I'm going to venture to say that each and every day, the older we get, the more we tend to worry. And we like to say to ourselves, I'm just concerned about it. I'm just concerned about it. But in reality, oftentimes, we're thinking that we have to solve the problem on our own, right? If I can just figure this out myself, then I'll have some peace of mind. Then I'll be comfortable in the situation. But how often do we rob ourselves of peace? How often do we rob ourselves of comfort because we forget that the joy and victory we have in Jesus is meant to shape our attitudes and also the joy that we have in Jesus means that we can approach his throne with freedom and with confidence and lay all of our troubles at his feet and say, Lord, I need your help. So what is it that you're worried about right now? Is it your bank account? Does it seem to be dwindling? Is it your retirement fund that you had nice and stocked up until the last couple months? Is it your health or the health of a loved one? The prognosis wasn't good that the doctor gave and you're wondering what's going to happen. Are you going to stay healthy or are you going to stay sick? Is it the relationships you have in life? What is it that causes you to worry? And now recognize that whether big worries or little worries big problems or little problems, your Savior is standing there with open arms, pointing you to the nail marks in his hand, saying, if I did this for you, of course I'm going to listen to all of your requests. I loved you that much to give my life for you, so now every single thing that is on your heart that causes you to stay awake at night, every single thing that seems to consume your waking thoughts and you just can't quiet your mind, bring it to me. Bring it to me and lay it at my feet and I assure you that I hear you and will answer you for your good. I will give you the strength to endure it. Even if it's temptation that you fall into again and again and you're worried that you will lose your faith in me, I assure you that I've already given you the victory. I have already fulfilled the law in your place and now by faith in me, you have done it perfectly as well. When I look at you, I don't see your stumblings and fumblings and failings. I only see the innocence that I provided you. So come to me. Come to me with every prayer, every petition, and I will give you peace. That's the other thing that Paul now goes into. Look at the next verse, verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As we bring all our requests to him, we can have the confidence to know that Jesus' peace will guard our hearts and minds. Now, it's true we could say that God is infinite and his love is infinite, his love is boundless. We will never get to the end of his love. We'll never get to its its width or height or depth. We'll never understand it completely in all its fullness because of just how great he is. But in this section, Paul isn't driving home the point, you'll never be able to fully grasp just how much God loves you. No, what he says in the Greek is actually, in the peace of God which transcends your mind, which transcends your mind. How often in life do we think that if we just think more positively, if we can just find the right method, if I can just have the right thoughts, then maybe I'll have more peace. And you see this in our lives and the lives of those around us. Maybe it's somebody that turns to 
countless self-help books and they think, if I can just get the proper structure in my life, if I can just do this or that or the other thing, then I'll have peace. And maybe one or two of their problems are solved, but they realize three more spring up and then they realize that book hasn't helped them and they look to another one and they say, if I can just have the right thinking, then I'll get over this, then I'll have peace. But what Paul is saying is, you're never going to be able to solve all of your problems. You're never going to be able to think through it all on your own. As many positive thoughts as you can try to force into your mind, you will never be able to fix all of your problems. There's always going to be some. But the one thing that's going to give you peace in life is not your struggling and striving to just think right. The one thing that's going to bring you peace in life is the joy that you have in Jesus. The peace alone that he gives. So come back to him. Come back to his promises and his word and sacraments. Come back and listen at the feet of your Savior Jesus and he will give you peace. He is your good shepherd. He's your bodyguard. He's your warrior. He fights all of your battles for you. He already conquered your sin and death and Satan and hell. And he assures you that he will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can separate you from his love. And if that is true, he is standing guard over your heart each and every day of your life. That is the peace that goes beyond understanding. And so stop and think about that. The next time that you feel overwhelmed, the next time you feel like the world is spinning out of control or your life is spinning out of control, the next time you think, if I just need to think this way, remember, no, Jesus has given me sure and lasting peace as my good shepherd. He walks by our side throughout life in the darkness as the light of the world, pulling us close to his side, close to his chest, and protecting and keeping us with his rod and staff which bring us comfort. And surely goodness and mercy will follow you and me all the days of our life until we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Joy comes from the peace that guards and protects our hearts in Jesus. And what does Paul then go on to say? Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Once we have that peace, which we have by faith in Jesus, we want to retain it. We want to keep it for ourselves. And now Paul shows us how we can keep peace in our hearts by God's power, by focusing our minds on good things. What is it that you fill your mind up with? Could you say that everything that goes into your eyes and goes into your ears and comes out of your mouth, all the different activities that you participate in are pure and noble and right and lovely and admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy? Or do we sometimes, do we sometimes rob ourselves of peace because we fill up our minds with bad things? So what do you watch online? What videos do you take in? What blogs or vlogs do you consume? What pictures and posts are you continually scrolling past on your social media accounts? What do you watch on television? What activities fill your days? What music goes into you? And what messages do all of those things send you? Do they give you an opportunity to lust or to become angry or to become resentful or to despair of where the world is? We go on with that list but what does it do to your heart and life? And oftentimes when we choose to go against God's will and fill up our minds and our hearts with bad things, that peace that we have in Jesus is rare to find. But thank God that he is that good shepherd. Thank God that he comes and rescues us and finds us and pulls us back to our senses and pulls us back and assures us, I've forgiven you of that. I still give you my peace at the cross and my empty tomb, but now, now in your life, fill up your mind with good things. 
The last section that we want to look at for today to see how joy affects our life is verses 10 to 13, where Paul is now switching gears to thank the congregation for their great love. And he wants to give them really the heart of contentment summarized and summed up in one statement, and we see it at the end. As we think about the joy that we have in Jesus, we see that we can be content in any situation. And maybe as you think about your life right now, what is something for which you may struggle with contentment? And now listen to what Paul says. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you are concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. That's a struggle, isn't it? To be content in all situations. And maybe as you sang that hymn before the sermon, I am content, I am content. Maybe that sinful nature was rearing in your heart and going, but what about this? I'm not really content about that right now in my life. What is it? We all have something that we think if we just had it, we'd be happy. Maybe it is that health that is out of our grasp. Maybe we struggle with chronic illness or our family members struggle with chronic illness. Maybe even our family members have been diagnosed with cancer. And our hearts rightly ache because we love them so much and we wonder what's going to happen to them. And we think to ourselves, if they were just healthy, then I'd be happy. Maybe it's those relationships that we do have where we enter into a rough patch and we get so focused on ourselves and what we need And we start to think of all the ways that they've hurt us and we just wish that that relationship would be fixed. We just wish everything would be put at peace, everything would be calm. And we think, well, that would be the height of happiness. In all situations, we could go on with the list, but what is it for you? Stop and think of the promise now that God gives you in the midst of that. If you're struggling with sickness, maybe even terminal illness, what is God's promise to you? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. In my Father's house are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and take you to be with me, that you may be where I am. Our entire goal as Christians is to work towards death and to pass through it, to get to the heavenly goal, because those infinite number of years that are waiting for us far surpass and pale. This life pales in comparison to them. So even if we or our loved ones pass away in death, that's when we finally enter into life and life forever. Or if it's relationship issues that you're having, your God says to you that as you live for him, as you keep fighting in that relationship to maintain it and keep it going, is he going to be with you to do his will? He is. Or if it comes down to finances and you say, what am I going to do in the future? I don't know where the money is going to come from to pay for all my medical bills. I don't know where all the money is going to come from to put food on the table. God says to you not to worry because he provides for the birds of the air and the grass of the field. And if he's done that, is he going to much more care for you and me? Oh, we of little faith, so do not doubt. Do not doubt, for great is your kingdom in store for you in heaven. Great is the reward that you have now. Your Lord is protecting you and shielding you by faith. Great is the joy that Jesus gives. It's a joy superior to anything this world can give. The theme of the whole service today is content with our inheritance. No matter what comes in life, no matter what has come in 2020, and no matter what is in store in 2020 and 2021, God grant us that we get there, and all the years of our life to follow, we have a never-changing joy found in the promises of our Savior Jesus because His faithfulness is the same every day, and He will not leave us or forsake us. So my command to you today isn't really a command. It's more of an urging and an encouragement, the same command, the same 
encouragement that Paul had for his congregation. Look to Jesus. See in him your joy. Find in him your peace and rest. And know that he is the one that's going to continue to give you that peace and rest. And rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. The joy Jesus gives us is superior. Amen.